Yeah, there was actually a couple of people, the Australians have a great term, they call it a Dorothy Dix. Um, somebody in the audience asked something that actually is a question or something you want to build on. And there, there was two people mentioned something about asking the right question. Asking the right question. That's a, that's a thing that I think very often we miss. And it's sort of like when I mentioned my SWAT analogy to, to, uh, to John. You know, much of what our exploration is like is very process driven. And you look at the house where the spinster and her cat live, or the, or the meth head, and they look identical. You tell the SWAT team to go in, they're just going to knock down the door and they're going to have that old lady on the, pinned down on the floor, lickety split. It doesn't matter who it is. They, we just go on autopilot, basically. You fly your airborne survey, you get your conductors, you do your stuff. All your KPIs, as John said, roll out. And we still haven't asked the question, and it was, it was a gentleman that I have enormous respect for, but it's like the Oracle at Delphi quite often, and sort of, he kept saying, we have to change the concept of search space. And search space is the reason why we go look, for me, why we go look in a particular area. And without changing our concept of search space, we're gonna go back to the same old places we always have. Maybe with incremental improvements in technology so we can see deeper, we can see Orioles bigger than before, we can see, you know, we're, we're obviously great in depth, as John said, we, we're very skilled in that regard. But we suck when it comes to choosing why we look in a particular area. We're all trendology people, as far as I can see. But we have data sets that tell us about that. Anyways, that's not my talk, and this is the last one, and I, I don't want to impede on your beer time too much. but. There was a, um, something I actually made a, a serendipitous discovery, although we, I don't say we were able to do anything with it at the time, but it was kind of a fun thing for me. So I wanted to review something that has been in the literature, coming and going, sort of phasing in and out. And to me, it's a bit like if you have the Hubble telescope and you have all these wonderful images, but you don't have a Stephen Hawking actually thinking about what it means, we in industry are pretty blind because we see stuff and we just say, well, that's an anomaly. Well, it's not an anomaly. It's a piece of geology that we haven't understood that has a geophysical expression. And EM, in the search for porphyry coppers, has really suffered from this because we have generated incredible images over the years, and very few people, I think, have actually stopped to think what they mean in terms of the geology. And without that understanding, then we're basically kind of scuppered in terms of using it as a, as a really predictive and useful tool. Anyways, the, the first one I could turn up, although I know Hans Lundberg did some interesting potential field work um, in, uh, in, in Buckins. Uh, this is from the Pima de, uh, uh, deposit in Arizona. Technically not a porphyry, but porphyry-esque. And within that, there was a strong EM anomaly that showed up. This was published, I think, in, the work was in 53, the publication was in 54. Uh, and that was, that was very interesting because he sort of said, hey, you know, if we had come up with this, you know, in our era, and we get an anomaly over in or, you know, this became a mine, you know, we everybody would be racing out doing that. But I don't think it actually, that actually what happened when Porphyry's the first wave, and I have a graph at the end, it's as ugly as uh, somebody else's, I guess, with years lead, but uh, uh, what I found with Porphyry's in the 50s is, was a stream set of geochemistry. That became the tool of choice. Geophysics was there, and people did experiments. Arthur Brandt was doing neat stuff. But it never really caught on. And in part, it was the, as Alan described, the very primitive nature of a lot of the technologies. We were just experimenting with things. We could do, we could do damage down to 100 meters or so, but that was pretty well the limit of it. So we did have some interesting observations. Um, in the beginning, it was a. It wasn't a VMS and it wasn't a nickel, it was down in the US, but they never really capitalized on it. So the porphyry model, I mean, it's all pretty standard stuff, but you know, there aren't many people that actually generate a resistivity model for this, or a chargeability model for this, or a susceptibility model for this. But those are the tools we often use to search for them. I search the literature and I can't find diddly squat that shows me what these sort of values are. We know people go and take data. Most of it never gets published. It gets lost. Don't look at it. But we have, by empiric empiricism, we actually have constructed some ideas as to what they look like. 
uh, alteration envelopes. We should have direct mapping between these sorts of plots and uh, between the ore and the alteration with physical properties. And we have some ideas. We, for an industry that's been doing this stuff for 80 years, having just a few ideas, that's what you should have over the weekend, not after almost a century of effort. You know, this is, this is, pretty, uh, this is pretty despicable. But anyways, and Dick, I actually have one of the formulas, because one of the things you find. I'm really proud of you, Dick. And, and uh, as you said, when you were talking about Peter in the room, I said, I can't tell you whether that's right or not, but what I liked was the picture at the top and they didn't chop off the rest of it. But this, this ended up being one of the, the primary things, this oxidized and enriched zone, the chalcosite blanket, that later on became recognized as a potential target for porphyry exploration, but not in the beginning, not in the beginning. Although we can see, we have direct evidence it was mapped back in the 60s, People had no clue what it was. They had anomalism, but they had no geological exploration concept to go with it. This is some of that data. Tony Berenger, who was uh, probably the, the sort of the A-type personality that um, Lee was describing, he was the guy who invented and always wanted to change. And the success of the Berenger organization was he had good commercial people to hold him down. But one of the things Tony did, very soon after the input airborne EM system was developed, he went down and started flying around in, in Arizona to see what he could get. Nobody told him not to do it. Nobody told him he would find something. He just said, let's see what we get. And that was that he got anomalies. He got some things over probably some of these few cases, the chalcosite blankets down in Arizona. There's another one. Uh, he flew over the mission pit. And uh, in the little text description, it's in the handout. The one on the left, they definitely labeled his culture. They saw that. They knew stuff would respond with the EM systems. But the other one was geologic. A vein, we don't really know. There was no geology map to go with it. This was in a promotional journal. It was never published. This is not Googleable. If you don't have a copy of it, you don't know what happened back in time. This is unfortunate. Circa 65. The Naranda people, uh, long before John was there, he was still in nappies or high school. And dreaming of being an astronaut like me, uh, they developed a ground DM system that found a porphyry system in British Columbia. There was sufficient mass, sufficient concentration of sulfides with a high enough conductivity that this deposit was found. And one of the other innovative things, I mean, these guys were pretty smart, it could handle topography. Uh, it was called the shootback system. It was primitive, but effective, and it, it uh, facilitated the discovery that Miranda actually mined. So we had a, a source. There's a little sketch you can see at the top of the, of the sulfides, but you know, no, no petrophysical measurements, no real, why is it in this deposit and not the one next door? Because there is a cluster of deposits in this particular area of BC. More observations. This one really uh, is, uh, I think, like what happened in the 50s, uh, early, late in the 60s and early 70s, with enormous amounts of effort by particularly American companies, although Canadian groups participated in a slightly different way because of deposits available to test, IP became this dominant technique, and EM sort of faded out of the picture for, as far as I can see, for about a decade. Uh, this is a, a courtesy of Mark Thoman from then with Phelps Dodge, but with FMX now. And just they, you know, ran huge amounts of IP, very effective for basically alteration mapping, finding the copper systems. So when you had something as good as this uh, through the 70s, that was really the system of choice. But this is a data set that we, um, the company I worked for at the time, Utah International, had just made a discovery of the Escondida deposit in Chile. And there was a fairly long hiatus after Pinochet had taken over in 1974. American companies had gotten burned, and it was difficult to get back in, but uh, Utah decided that, well, in the, in the early 80s, time was good. So they set up a joint venture with Getty. They had Dave Wall running it, and um, found the deposit, a uh, very, very significant copper deposit in northern Chile. And we ran one line, one line of complex resistivity with Zong. Uh, it was seven kilometers long. It cost in the day $100,000. Uh, 
uh, the Kalichi was significant. It was breaking the teeth on a D9 ripper, trying to get holes to put the water in to do the survey. But uh, the, the, the data that we had access to, there is a chargeability anomaly, but it's not very coherent. The resistivity results had this uh, sort of steep <coughs> dipolar type feature here, which at the time, there was no UBC code to invert it. So we didn't have any geometric outcome. We just had this anomaly, and it got stronger with higher frequency. This was a CR survey, so we think we ran up to at least 100 hertz or more. The inversion at the top is, was done actually in 2013 by Scott Urquhart. And this flat line feature here, that is pretty much where the chalcosite blanket was at Escondida before the pit was mined. Okay? We saw that in 1982, but there was no action on it. We did not actually know. People were said, oh, that's a solar, that's conductive water in the, in the, in the, in the, in the overlying sediments. Bullshit. It wasn't. It was a significant geological feature that we didn't have a freaking clue what to do with. The company also was paranoid about finding another deposit, so they went over to Argentina and stopped all exploration. But that was a sort of di different story. So we had this observation. We actually tried to get an input system into Chile to fly to see if we could find it, replicate it. Uh, that didn't happen, but people press on. Uh, this actually, we had a little better IP survey. But this is the resistivity result here. There's the Escondida pit. That's the, that's the line of CR basically through there. Uh, and um, Kennecott came in with what they called their bi uh, RIP now, but bipole dipole system, and had a uh, uh, the resistivity result shown off for reasons I still don't know, sitting kind of off to the southeast corner of the, what became the major pit. And then EN at the top, that's uh, Escondida Norte. Another, it's all one giant system, and there's a, I think, Pampa deposit sitting in here. So all one huge, and then Zalbadar, which Barrick owns, I think they've sold part of it to somebody else now, but all of this one humongous porphyry system that's been broken up into a couple of pieces. But the blanket response we saw was there. There's another one over top of Escondida Norte, which we picked up with ground geophysics and geotem. But that was the first one, and it was, it was done uh, in 1982. The, uh, the lads at Quantec um, uh, were struggling to get uh, and marketing IP services 10 years later in Chile. Big problem, Caliche, as we had 10 years earlier at Escondida. And my understanding is, uh, well, led by, I think, Randall Nixon, who was running the office, uh, they were doing work for Chevron. And uh, over at the uh, what became the Coyawasi deposit, Eugenio Rosario, and they they got an IP response, but it was slow and costly. So they said, "Hey, we got some Johnics equipment. Let's let's run that. See what we get." So they did, and they just got this gangbuster of anomaly again. Strong lateral conductor. It wasn't groundwater. It was the chalcosite blanket again. So finally, they had the epiphical evidence. Randall ran around all of Santiago trying to sell this to people. And I, understand, I know some of the people today are still working, even geophysicists, didn't believe, didn't believe it. They said, no, no, that can't be right. Well, unfortunately, it was right. <laughs> Randall started working for, uh, for BHP. They caught up and, uh, cottoned on to the idea. This is the stuff from um, Escondida Norte. You can see a downhole log along the side here. So this is uh, air, uh, airborne work, 25 hertz system, and uh, the blanket response. And there's a very good correlation uh, conductivity with total sulfides and uh, so they knew the model well at least they knew the model at Escondida and that maybe was their hubris as the application of airborne EM the first campaign we say hey we can find it on the ground by God we can find it in the air so BHP mounted an enormous program sort of similar in a way to the big Naranda Abitibi project but a decade earlier, flew this large block of ground up in Chile. Uh, they had about two, two or three years. They worked on the data, originally acquired with a CASA twin engine system, then called Geotem, uh, to go back into the Andes in 1997. Uh, aviation safety rules had changed, and we required a four-engine aircraft airliner. That became Megatem. Megatem was designed for one reason, to get around safety issues. We would have been just as happy flying Geotem, but that's what we had to fly. So birth of a new technology. 
Did they find anything? They found some prospects, but they never found another Escondida. They never found another Juca Kamada. <coughs> Naranda at the time, and I'm not sure if you were involved with this, John, probably were, was exp they were experimenting with geotem as well, but in a slightly different box uh, in terms of exploration. The, the chalcocyte blanket model didn't seem to be driving them. It was more of a mapping paradigm. And they did some very interesting work and in calibration over a number of deposits around the same time that we were developing our, our chalcocyte blanket model inside BHP for Chile in the arid zone. Uh, they were looking at how to use geotemp to map in Arizona. And there's some images, that, you know, they actually published some interesting images about what they found. I don't, I don't believe from the, the record that they actually found any new deposits. They gained some geoscience knowledge. It was sort of an interesting spark, an interesting bit of light. Uh, nobody else, as far as I know, really did anything like this until probably 15 years later. Another piece of uh, the useful puzzle, I guess, came out in 1994. This in the U.S., the USGS, for, for a moment of laxness, I guess, if anything else, went down and did some, uh, had Schlumberger would do some borehole logging at a new uh, discovery, Santa Cruz in Arizona. And the uh, chalcosite blanket down there, not thick, but when they ran through the chalcosite blanket, you could see a very, very strong conductive response. So we knew we could find it on multiple continents. Uh, so it was a valid target model, but the efforts by BHP to sort of do a SWAT team approach just didn't result in too much in terms of new discoveries. Um, EM responses. Um, again, this was a, um, an effort in a porphyry train in, uh, the, in the country of Iran around the Chesma deposit. This wasn't the best EM system, it was a frequency domain, but it was the only one they could get into the country. And in that box, in that circle there, the Chesma deposit will zero in. So they flew a very large area in the beginning, but we have a very nice little annulus response uh, situated through here around the actual deposit. So clearly there's something, uh, some sort of alteration halo I think we're picking up. Um, obviously I think as you understand we weren't able to get a lot of feedback out of Iran as to what this might be. But even in places where we could have gotten feedback, it still never happened very often. This is the 935 hertz fairly low, which is good because I think there's a, there is some surficial conductivity you can see in the background data. Um, BHP through their uh, Efforts, exploration efforts in Asia, worked on the Recuidic deposit. This is this is an awesome um, uh, real estate, right? Because you've got uh, uh, Afghanistan off to one side uh, and uh, Iran off to the other, right in the western corner of Pakistan. So uh, this now is, I believe, being mined by the Chinese or attempting to be mined by the Chinese, but. BHP discovered it and then sold it to, I think it was a combination of Barrick and Anto. But there was a whole series of porphyry systems. This is the mag popping up, but this one right in here, they're not all the same too, which is interesting. The, uh, what's called the H4 leech cap, this had chalcocyte blanket. So this thing is going on in a number of different places. Geophysically, it's a very nice target because it's, it's flat line. It, it's maybe down a couple hundred meters, but our systems are quite capable of handling that. But as you would understand, if you have a, an environment like here at Recuidic, uh, there's a, there would be a lot of porphyry systems which wouldn't respond with that particular system. So you kind of have to understand the weathering history, the geology, to use it effectively. This was done with ground EM. Uh, we actually, we thought very long and hard because we were doing a lot of geotem at the time in BHP about getting a CASA system into Pakistan. And uh, many people around the table said, yeah, it'd be a great idea, but they shook their heads when they thought about the security issues. It was not, not a great idea. Uh, Spectrum was flown over Koyawasi uh, and Yohina in about 2000, and they call it revalidated the M anomaly that was, was obtained with the ground EM. Um, some mining had started to take place, but uh, it was nice to see. I remember Eddie Costlin was very pleased when he first saw these results. But the most interesting one for me was over Koyawasi itself. They had these incredible EM results that uh, were end up being published in 2006, done with ground EM. 
And this isn't a chalcocyte blanket. These are actually massive sulfide veins of a tenor that can be or extend down well past, they say, 500 meters depth in the porphyry and are first mapped with, with surface <coughs> times an ADM, and now they're using borehole to trace these down. It's somewhat reminiscent of what I remember a, a description of the Butte deposit, the D veins, very, very high sulfide load in these things. So some porphyries are gonna be quite amenable to, um, to being picked up with EM, that's not just the blanket response. And of course, where did I find this? This is the state of our nation. This was in the financial report to investors who, who appeared, Glencore put this together for a tour. This was never put into a scientific publication or an exploration publication. This will show up in Google, but it's, it's, they thought, they think so little about what we can do. It's just sort of like, hey, and I even asked the people at Anglo would they allow publication of this and put some background and sort of, you know, hey, we're busy firing people. <laughs> One of the uh, most recent developments, uh, and it looks pretty interesting, and it finally, I finally think it's a, uh, maybe I've got some greater legitimacy. I mean, not that the EM, direct detection with EM isn't legitimate, but it seemed pretty variable, and there was a, you know, a number of efforts to, to define this elsewhere in several continents, and sometimes you see it, and sometimes you don't. But with an AFMAG system that uh, uh, goes under the trade name ZTEM, uh, offered by Geotech, you're starting to get a mapping capability which seemed to start to give you an idea about mapping a system as opposed to trying to find a specific target. It's not that IP and direct DM detection, if there's something to detect, aren't a good idea. Uh, but ZTEM has the advantage of, of basically allowing you to fly a large area and do some sort of prospecting as opposed to just going in and mapping on a, at a specific level. Because if you don't get an EM anomaly, it doesn't mean there's not a porphyry system there or a depth or undercover. So this was some trial modeling done uh, about 2007, 2008. They did some flying. Uh, they had a partnership with uh, Phelps Dodge at the time. And it looked promising. And uh, this is a result from a deposit in north, northwestern US. That's a, that was actually until a, a, a year and a half ago of producing molly stock. And so it's kind of characteristic of the sort of anomalies we're seeing with ZTIP. The blue is the resistivity lobe. So we're sort of seeing an annulus in the intrusive is, is this high resistivity zone. And you sort of say, well, okay, but there's a lot of blue, but you combine that with the shape a more, you know, sort of semicircular, and it's quite suggestive. Most of these long linear features are, are mappable faults. In this particular area, there's a very thick cover of volcanic material as well, which adds, a, adds an interesting component to the story. This is one from British Columbia. There's a uh, mineralized porphyry stock sitting right here. There's the, blue, the blue, with the white line and then the blue annulus here. And this is sort of what the, even the modeling showed a few years earlier, so it's, it's very pleasing. The problem, in part, is here's another porphyry stock just to the south, and it looks different. So even within maybe, maybe a fault offset between these two, this is called the NAC, and this is the, uh, is it the Jenny? Um, anyways, there, and there's a couple of kilometers in between. So this one, you say, hey, I love that one. That's take home. Uh, we're going to ignore that one, but you know this is the nature of exploration. We don't always get the same response, even even close by. Similar systems. One that was talked about here at the uh, meeting just a couple of days ago. The first quantum people now have the uh, Cobra deposit when they bought Inmet, and they've been you know I think people have been working on this literally for the last 30 years, uh, but it's been hard to to be. You can see the drill hole, drill holes, drill holes. <coughs> This area here showed up as a, as a significant Z10 anomaly and got drilled and uh, ended up being uh, a very, very nice zone of higher grade mineralization, which I think they were really hoping to find at some point. So here's kind of the, the history of the story. Um, and I, what I did really is I put mine on the, on, the, on the side so to make it look more attractive, right? But the letters labeled on the, on the far left are the documentation and I say you know, this is this is really what as an industry that we need some information about these techniques if we're going to learn what's going on. 
P being some sort of professional documentation, which means it probably is Googleable in time, uh, if you go back far enough. Um, C is commercial, which basically means like Behringer's advertising. And then N is basically nothing. That basically means I know something about it because I happened to be there at the time. You know, I saw Kennedy being shot, so nobody else knows that Kennedy was shot, right? <laughs> it's sort of like, and then question mark means don't have a clue. And, and unfortunately, we're, we're, we're not really, even though the first paper was, you know, professional here, commercial, professional, nothing, professional, commercial. So unless you have these commercial documents, now we are getting a bit better, but there's a huge, you know, 50-year history when we were doing a lot of our work. This stuff is invisible. People just don't know it existed. And so why would not some bright young student say, hey, let's go look at this problem and get some data? And you say, boy, oh, we were doing this a while ago, but it's not their fault because it's not available for people to examine. So until we start expressing ourselves more coherently, trying to get more material out uh, in, the, in the literature and get it to, in the system, uh, you know, we could be repeating this. I mean, I, I was told once that we're really slow in geophysics and it takes us 25 years to get effective technology implemented. It's a lot longer. It's unfortunately a lot longer. We're still not asking the right questions. So with that, I think I'm pretty darn close to six, and those are the people I'd like to thank. And I'd like to thank all of you for coming today. Safe journeys.